to help us as we continue discerning our common call. So now, make sure you're on the Wi-Fi, right, if you're comfortable with it. And then sit back and listen as we begin our exploration of the marks of mission with a reflection from our bishop on Mark 2. Teach, nurture, and baptize new believers. Two seconds, I was told. Um, just, uh, I, I decided to start with uh, Mark of Mission 2 uh, because I think it's the logical place to start. I, some of you have heard me say this before. Uh, now, 20 years ago, almost, uh, the Episcopal Church declared the decade of evangelism. How many remember that? Uh, I thought it was sort of dumb. And part of the reason I thought it was dumb is I'm a, I'm a Christian formation person, and I was profoundly aware that too many people in the pews didn't know the story and were hardly in a position to evangelize, and that the teaching need, I thought we needed to have the decade of formation first and then have the decade of evangelism. Some can push back with me on that, uh, but that's, that was my rationale. Um, so that's why I decided to start with teach first and uh, proclaim second. You ready for me? Here we go. A reading from Acts of the Apostles. <coughs> now the apostles and believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the uncircumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? <coughs> then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds. I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. In 1995, I had the privilege of meeting and organizing a lecture weekend that featured Lauren Mead, founder of the Alban Institute and author of the One Cent Future Church, Transforming Congregations for the Future. I noticed recently that subtitle was changed to Transforming Congregations for a New Mission Frontier. He's written many other books and articles. Lauren was prescient in recognizing the Western Church had entered what he labeled a post-Christendom era. He recognized that the days of the Church enjoying a privileged and cozy relationship with the wider culture and its structures were over. Earlier than many others, 
Lauren Mead recognized that we had entered a time more closely resembling the period of the nascent church as it attempted to forward Christ's mission in its earliest days after Easter. Those were challenging times for the church, but they were also times filled with the Holy Spirit and incredible opportunities. The story of Cornelius the Centurion reflects that early, spirit-filled apostolic church. Today, it offers us lots of food for thought. It's a watershed episode in Luke's second volume narrative. From this point on in Acts, the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's work and presence in the newly birthed church is not only for the Jews, it is for the Gentiles as well. In its day, this is a radical, boundary-breaking thing that unnerved some within the Jewish Christian circle at first, but which many came to accept, even if begrudgingly. So important is the story of Peter's vis vision, the visit to Cornelius, and the conversion of his household in the narrative of Acts, that the author doesn't merely tell it once, he tells it twice. He provides the original account of the story in chapter 10 of Acts, he then retells it in chapter 11, as Peter recounts the event to a skeptical group of apostles in Jerusalem. That Luke tells the story twice underscores its importance. Pay attention, Luke is saying to us. Pay attention. This is important. He similarly underscores the importance of Christ's call of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. That story is told three times in Acts. There are lots of interesting things that can be said about the Cornelius and Peter visions. There is the petty anger of the circumcised believers who, having heard that Peter had eaten with Cornelius' family, challenge him, what were you doing eating with the Goyims? I I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> Peter explained it to them step by step. Key to the story, as Peter retells it, is the persistence of the heavenly vision. When something like a large sheet came down with all that non-kosher meat on it, the voice reiterated three times to Peter, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Another key is Peter's underscoring the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the incident. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as it had on us at the beginning. Peter makes the interpretive connection with Pentecost, as well as with the words of the Lord. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of critical importance is Peter's compelling conclusion. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? This last statement was clearly the tipping point in the argument. The narrator tells us when they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. It is a stunning wondrous passage in Acts. It changes everything. We're here today because of that incident. When God stirred up Peter with his vision, Peter was sent to Cornelius' home. Peter didn't send an invitation to Cornelius and his family, inviting them to his church. Cornelius and his family's involvement with and in the church would likely come later, in fact, did. Tradition holds that Cornelius was the second bishop of Caesarea. Still, the initial contact, the initial ministry, the initial evangelization took place in Cornelius' home. The Holy Spirit summoned Peter to go to them, and Peter went. I believe there is a twofold message for us here. First, we must get out of our buildings and bring our witness to Christ to people where they are. Second, 
we must get the faith into people's homes. I've been saying that since I arrived in the Diocese of New Jersey. Be clear, I am not saying that gathering in our sacred sanctuaries isn't important. I am not saying that gathering in our sacred sanctuaries isn't important. I'm not saying that at all. Our churches should be places of vibrant worship and community and schools for discipleship. I am, however, saying that the attractional model no longer works that we have to go out to meet people where they are. In some places, this has already been going on. St. Peter's Igbo Church in Hamilton, under the leadership of Canon Linus Amanu, is one of our most lively, faithful, and growing congregations. Are they still here? St. Peter's, where are you? Yay, give me a hand. When I first came to the diocese, they were in inner city Trenton at the old St. Andrew's Church building. They told me in the middle of a service when the church was packed and people were out the doors, they told me they needed a bigger building for worship. Bishop, we need a bigger church. Due to the successful merger of St. Matthias Hamilton and St. James Yardville into Holy Apostles Yardville, under the capable leadership of Canon Art Powell, a building was available. Yay, Art, yay, though, yeah, go say hi, are you? The people of St. Peter's Igbo Church purchased that building in Hamilton and continued to thrive and grow. They shared with me some time ago that it had all begun with house churches in people's homes. Am I right? Say yes, Bishop. <laughs> Thank you. They went out, in, they did say yes, I didn't push them into that, I want you to know that. They went out into the community and met people where they were. One of the chief strategies of Canon Ramon Ubiera, our Hispanic missioner, is house church, gathering people in the home. Bishop, that's what we do. We meet in people's homes, he said to me. It's like Peter in the household of Cornelius. Our Latino congregations are the primary area of growth in our diocese right now. This is due both to the growth of our Latino churches Cristo Rey Trenton, San Andres Camden, and San Jose Elizabeth, and to our effort at planting and nurturing new Latino congregations with existing congregations, as in All Saints Lakewood, St. Thomas Red Bank, Christ Church Toms River, and Trinity Asbury Park. In each of these latter instances, Father Ramon went out into the community like Peter and began talking about Jesus and his love in people's homes and then gathering them into the wider church. I believe all of our congregations could learn something from their examples. Start experimenting with house churches. Invite friends, neighbors, and family to simple Bible studies and prayer services in your homes. Initially, it's much less threatening than inviting them to church. I experimented with house churches when I was rector of St. Paul's Delray Beach. It is meaningful and it helps strengthen the church. We also need to get the faith into people's homes. St. Peter's Church in Freehold, where St. Peter's, they're here, give me a hand, give me a cheer. St. <laughs> Peter's Church in Freehold, under the leadership of Rector Dirk Ranking and Christian Educator Director Ann Delgado, has stopped offering traditional Sunday school on Sunday morning. They now offer resources to get the faith into people's homes encouraging parents to be the primary instructors of their children. They did this in response to a Bishop Spring Conference we offered a couple of years ago. St. Peter's supports this by offering monthly life programs, life standing for living in faith every day, which gathers people of all ages once a month to learn about the Bible and our faith traditions, serve our community, and spend time in fellowship with each other. Each month, there is a different focus and activity. In the coming weeks, they will look at journeying through Holy Week. They'll examine Holy Communion, Pentecost, and welcoming the Holy Spirit. Father Russell Griffin, rector of St. Uriel Siegert, are they here? Yeah. <laughs> Father Russell Griffin, rector of St. Uriel Siegert, is nurturing both existing believers and new believers using a traditional tried and tested tool. He introduced the Alpha program to his congregation this past year. 
70 people enrolled in the program. In a congregation whose average worship is about 100, this is a stunning statistic. On a recent visitation to St. Uriel's, I asked for a show of hands how many had taken the course. More than half the hands in the church went up. Father Griffin had young people take the course, four teenagers I confirmed on a recent visitation there. Parents took the course. This prepares them to nurture and teach their own children. I'm aware that St. Mark's Basking Ridge just started an alpha group this Lent. Am I right? Where's St. Mark's? Yes? There we go. Give me a hand. Where's Father Kent Wally in Gladstone? Where are you? Did they leave? They went home? On the right. There we go. St. Luke's Gladstone. Father Kent Wally and the people of St. Luke's Gladstone have worked closely with Rob Drosty. They also use Alpha as a growth and evangelism tool. Father Wally reports that Rob's work with their growth discipleship committee was a very important catalyst. Attendance is up 10% over last year. The three-year trend for Christmas is particularly encouraging. From 2015 to 2017, total worshipers on Christmas Eve went from 617 to 716 to 812, respectively. Easter is up similarly, 573 to 592 to 691. Since January 2016, St. Luke's has added 30 new families. Over the last three years, they've gone from one weekly Bible study of about 10 members to three weekly Bible studies of 45 members. People are hungry. They are hungry to learn the Bible. St. Luke's continues to grow. Their middle school youth group has grown from about eight a couple of years ago to 15 to 20. Good work, St. Luke's Gladstone. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, the Diocese of New Jersey received a $50,000 constable grant from the Episcopal Church to develop resources to get the faith into people's homes. One element of this is something I called Family Faith Night. I wrote the grant. I took an initial stab at Family Faith Night when I was the rector of St. Paul's Delray Beach. The idea is to encourage families to choose one night in the week and designate it Family Faith Night. We then provide households with a short video offering support and guidance in shaping the Family Faith Night experience. I am grateful to Ann Delgado, Rob Bullington, Jonathan Elliott, Teresa Dunn, Pete Cornell, and other members of the Constable Grant Task Force who have produced the first installment of the Family Faith Night video. We're going to share that with you now. So while we're transitioning the platforms here, um, this is an interactive uh, at-home experience. It's intended to be fun. It's intended to be engaging. It's intended to work at many levels. Um, so we've embedded in it uh, a, a learning technology called Kahoot, uh, which is what we're using at the moment. And I'm just waiting for the uh, come up here on the screen. You all are going to be able to play this. Uh, so there's going to be a link at the top of the page that you'll be able to go to. Kahoot IT, and uh, you'll get a PIN number, and you'll be able to go in and take the poll with us as we watch this. I am especially grateful to the dozen-odd people that volunteered as talent. Uh, we made a pilot using several people, and we chose uh, a pair of younger folks. Thank you. 
some faces, I think. Hi. Welcome to Faith for Everyone Everywhere. If you're here looking for some ways to bring faith into your family conversation, we are here to help. In this series, we will present an overview of some key faith topics. Like Bible stories and seasons of the church here, and give you some tools and conversation starters so you can bring some faith home for your own family. Let's go. Let us pray. O God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray you, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Martin Luther once said, most certainly, father and mother are apostles, bishops, and priests to their children, for it is they who make them acquainted with the gospel. No pressure. Okay, that might seem like a tall order, especially when some of us may not be 100% confident with our own faith knowledge. But don't worry, we are here to help. We know that parents are the biggest influence in a child's life. We also know that faith is most likely to stick when it is incorporated at home, not just in church once a week or month. it lady good for you so if like the evangelist john in his third book in the new testament you have no greater joy than to hear that your children are walking in the truth then we welcome you to try this new program as a fit for your life where you are when you have time in your schedule Faith at home works best when it becomes part of the fabric of your family's daily life. In this series, we're going to give you some casual conversation starters and some more intentional devotions. But we are also going to point out how to take some of the things you're already doing and put them in a faithful contest. You, you can, can do, do it. it! Most of our activities fall into four categories, which my Lutheran pastor friend David Anderson calls the keys of faith. First, caring conversations, which can happen anywhere, anytime. Maybe around the dinner table, in the car on the way to school activities, or as part of a bedtime routine. Sometimes you'll have to be more intentional, and that's why we're here. So turn off the TV, put the devices on a shelf for a few minutes, and ignore the resulting howls from your family. We will give you some topics in each session, but many caring conversations are spontaneous and simply involve your willingness to listen and respond honestly. Even if the answer is, I don't know, that's okay. None of us has all the answers, but let's keep the conversation going. Next, in worship and devotion. 
This can be at church on Sunday or any other day, or prayer alone at meals or bedtime. We're also going to give you a short devotion to use at home, starting in the next episode. is a great resource here. It's got a ton of prayers for all occasions, plus devotions for individuals, families, and entire congregations. You can use something from the Book of Common Prayer as is or adapt it to meet the needs of your family. here okay we're more that was the halfway point the third key of faith is ritual and traditions this include many of the daily activities and special events your family already does celebrating a birthday that's a tradition go for ice cream after a big game that's a ritual we will help you take this and put them in a faithful contest and maybe give you some ideas for new ones. Finally, service to others. This one is pretty straightforward. We are the body of Christ in this world. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. One of our five baptismal bones in the Spiritual Boy Church is to seek and serve Christ in all persons. It is sort of a basic requirement, but also a great way to raise faithful, caring, and compassionate kids. Christianity is about relationships between us and God and among ourselves. Service to others builds those relationships. Like the other keys of faith, you might already be doing something like this, or maybe you're ready to start. and help put it into context. Before you know it, you will be waving faith into your family's family. So, what do you need to do? First, prioritize like bringing faith into your family's life. It is important. Warning, you will encounter some bad attitudes. Persevere. Ask God for a strength and guidance, knowing that all your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. Isaiah 54, 13. Continue to persevere, and don't be discouraged. Some sessions might be mostly silent at first. Everyone might not be as enthusiastic about this as you are, but soon your family will begin to participate. You are sowing the seeds of faith, which might take years to bloom. Two questions left. For next time, get a book of common prayer, either a hard copy from your local bookstore or access it online. Get a Bible to use, one that you have on hand. If you're starting fresh, consider getting a new Revised Standard Version. That's the one we use in church. This one is actually both a Bible and a Book of Common Prayer. It's really handy. It is clear and it is good. 
but any Bible will work for this. Finally, get a nice candle. A white pillar candle would be ideal, but if yours is in a jar and smells like pumpkin spice or ocean breeze, that's okay too. Okay, you can do this. Before we go, we'll give you some caring conversation to get this started. Try them this week. Tell stories about people who have shared faith with you in your life. How did they do this? Why did it make an impact? See, See you, you next, next time. time. As we say in church, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, we would like to know, we, we asked two questions about this experience. Um, and we'd appreciate your giving us some guidance as to know whether this is, uh, I have to tell you, that was the most energizing I've seen this crowd in the 15 years I've been coming here. So, yeah. this was a lot of fun. Right, is Emily returning? Go, there you are. I've been told some uh, in a number of parishes that you can't teach Episcopalians new things, and we're clear. I've been told that you can't teach Episcopalians new things by certain parishioners, and uh, they were wrong. So. I'm going to invite you now to spend some time in conversation with one another about how we are living out the call to teach, nurture, and baptize in our diocese already and how else God might be calling us to do this. I'm gonna invite you to form conversational groups of about six to eight people around the table. Some of you will need to turn your chairs around in that very tight space. Thank you for your sacrifice. So form yourselves into groups of six or eight people that have representatives from at least two different congregations or ministries in the diocese in each group. And then in your groups, Please appoint one person a scribe to interact with the Poll Everywhere question for you. In each group, you're going to appoint a scribe to interact with the Poll Everywhere questions. So only one person has to manage a phone or tablet in the conversation. Can I have quiet, please, just so people can hear the instructions? Quiet, please. Thank the person who is going to be your scribe and, and ask them to record about five, up to five things that are great insights or stories that you hear in your table conversations. We will have about 10 minutes for the conversations. During that 